Today is IES Men's Day. Uh, we celebrate and we, we put this calendar alongside American Father's Day weekend. Uh, but we, in IES, we call it Men's Day, and we'll take some time to pray for all the men and give thanks to God for all the men of IES. Um, as, as an Indonesian, let me just say to you, uh, and I know like for Australians, you guys celebrate uh, different days of Father's Day. Uh, American Father's Day and its counterpart, American Mother's Day, uh, it's not something that I hold really dear in my heart. I don't celebrate it religiously. Um, my kids love to celebrate me as their father, thank God. I'm still you know, a pretty decent father to them. And they love to make um, handmade things for me, handmade cards for me every Father's Day and every Mother's Day for um, my wife. But being Indonesian, I celebrate Hari Ayah, which falls on the 12th of November, and Hari Ibu, which falls on the 22nd of December. But there is also another, just a minor reason why I don't particularly hold American Mother's Day dear to my heart. And let me just, you know, explain this carefully so that I don't come out, come out as insensitive. I love taking uh, my wife, the mother of my children, you know, to take them out and celebrate Mother's Day. We'll have a good lunch. But it's not really something like, if I forget it, then I forget it, you know. And some people like, you know, if you forget Mother's Day, how can that be? That's heresy. But the reason is this, American Mother's Day, which is a secular holiday, uh, falls very close to and sometimes even on the same weekend as Pentecost Sunday. And much to my chagrin, in many churches, in many churches, this secular holiday oftentimes overshadows, even replaces Pentecost Sunday, which I think is a more important, if not the most important day in the church. And as a church person, I'm really bugged by this infiltration of secular culture in the church. I think the church celebration should take precedence and envelopes every other celebration. But sometimes the celebration takes precedence. But let not my being annoyed or being bugged stop us from celebrating the IES, the men of IES this week. And we'll celebrate, we'll definitely celebrate the goodness of God and the goodness of the men that we have in our lives today when we pray for all the men in IES. But today I want to celebrate first and foremost, not the fathers, not the men of IES. What I want to celebrate today is the heavenly father that we have. Our heavenly father that we have. The father of our Lord Jesus Christ who because of him has also become our father. Why I want to start there? Because our heavenly father is the reason why we can celebrate all these other things in life. All the good things in life that we can celebrate and give thanks for is because of our heavenly father. So today, let's celebrate our father's day, right? Our father's day and the good news that he gives us. And we'll do that by unpacking, by looking at the prayer that the Apostle Paul offered to the Father. The prayer that is recorded for us in the, in the third chapter of his letter to the Ephesians. Ephesians 3, 14 to 21. And I'm calling this message for our Father's Day, the praying the gospel of our Father. Praying the gospel of our Father. Now, I just made you sit down, but I'm going to ask you again to stand up if you're able for the reading of God's Word. If you're able, please stand, and let me just read Ephesians 3, 14 to 21 for you. And let this prayer, let the prayer that Paul offered capture you like never before through the power of the Holy Spirit, that it also become our prayer. It becomes our prayer that we offer to God in confidence that he will answer this prayer. And therefore, our lives will be changed like never before. So Ephesians 3, 14 to 21. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Pay attention to that verse. From whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Sometimes we get into debates, do we worship the same God or not with you know, other people and all that kind of stuff. Those are good debates to have. But the fundamental truth when it's coming from the top to the bottom is that the Father is the one from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power 
through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. We'll unpack that later. Now to him, Paul exclaimed this praise, who is able to do immeasurably more than we all ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the Apostle Paul. But most of all, thank you for what Jesus has done through him and in him and through the Holy Spirit, he can express this prayer to you. And thank you, Lord, that by the same spirit, this prayer can also be our prayer. And so as we reflect on this prayer this morning, as we reflect on the good news of you, our Father, help us to be captured into this prayer like never before and help us make this prayer our prayer with the confidence that through the Spirit and in Jesus, it is your good pleasure to answer this prayer, to change us more and more into the likeness of your Son, in whose name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Please take your seats again. As a biblical geek, I admire the Apostle Paul. And to say that my admiration for Paul is great is an understatement. Paul is a person with zeal for mission. He's, after all, recognized as the greatest missionary ever lived. I also love to listen to Paul teach. Not literally, of course, but through his letters, through his teaching. I think he's a great theologian. He's considered the greatest interpreter of the mind of Jesus. But Paul doesn't stop at that. Paul is also somebody who's spirit-filled, And I love to hear the Apostle Paul pray. No one prays as thoughtfully, as passionately, and as expansively as Paul, except, of course, the Lord Jesus himself, in whose name Paul prays in. And so I admire his missionary zeal. I love to hear his preaching and teaching of the gospel, to unpack the theology of the triune God to us. But I also love to hear Paul praise Praise the gospel. And I especially love to hear him pray the gospel of our Father, which we find in the third chapter of Ephesians. Listen again to the prayer. I pray, Paul says, that out of his glorious riches, that is the Father's glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know that this love surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Wow. Nothing in this prayer is mediocre. It is very thoughtful, it is blatant, it is extravagant, it is expansive. Now, before we go further, let me just give you some context of the piece of text we just read. I've said this before, that text without a context is a pretext for a con. Looking at a text without its context will give us a risk to be conned, to be tricked. Text without a context is a pretext for a con. And so we don't want to be con. We need to look at the context of the text that we just read. Now, up to this point in his letter to the Ephesians, Paul has been opening up the gospel of Jesus Christ for us. He's been articulating for us a way of reading reality. We look at reality through glasses, through a glasses that we call worldview, as we talked about last week. And he's articulating a way of reality that is shaped by life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. And then Paul falls on his knees. He prays on his knees. Now, it'll probably be helpful for you to know that 
To be on their knees is not the normal posture for Jewish people to take when praying. Kneeling was the normal posture for Gentiles, but not for Jewish people. Jewish people stood to pray. They lift up their hands to pray. But not this time. This time Paul gets down on his knees. Now, partly because he is identifying himself with the Gentiles, because after all, he is the apostle to the Gentiles, but mostly because kneeling expresses a deeper reverence and a more fervent longing. And so on his knees, Paul, as it were, takes our hearts into his hands and then lifts them to the living God, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, asking him to do in their hearts, to do in our hearts, what only the Father can do in human hearts. He prays the gospel of the Father that he has been preaching to take its rightful place in our hearts. In jail. He gets down on his knees in jail while waiting trial before Caesar. In jail where he no doubt agonizes over why he, the greatest missionary, the ambassador of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, should be in such crummy circumstances where he no doubt also prayed for release from prison, where he no doubt also prayed for wisdom to make his defense, to make his case before Caesar, before the emperor. In jail, on his knees, Paul, as it were, takes our hearts into his hands and then lifts them up to God, the God of the gospel, and prays the gospel into our hearts, into the control center of our being. Now, if you read Ephesians before, you know that earlier in chapter 1, he tells us that he's been praying. In chapter 3, we find that he actually prays. He prays the gospel. He prays the gospel of our Father into our hearts. In chapter 1, he prays that we might know the gospel. Chapter 1, verse 17, he says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that, why? So that you may know him better. He prays that we might know the gospel. In our text, in chapter 3, he prays that we might experience the gospel. It's not just enough to know, but it's also experience, head and heart. In chapter 1, he prayed that we might know the God of the gospel. In chapter 3, he prays that we might experience the God of the gospel, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I love this about Paul. He's not just a heady theologian. He's also a charismatic at heart. He's a charismatic theologian. Now, before we go into the content of the prayer, let's just take a quick look at the one to whom Paul prays. The Father. For this reason, I kneel before the Father. The Father of Jesus. Who, because of Jesus and because of what Jesus has done in obedience to the Father, is now our Father. (laughs) Wow. Kids? Wow. Yes. You see, Paul here is taking seriously what Jesus taught us. Jesus taught us in his Sermon on the Mount. When you pray, say, our Father, yes. This is, the one of, this is, I think, one of the greatest blessings of the good news of Jesus. To address the awesome and holy God, the living God, as Father. To address God the way Jesus does. You see, Paul really believes the good news of Jesus That because of Jesus, we have been adopted by Jesus' Father. And we now share the same status with Jesus. The same status that Jesus has with his Father. If you don't get anything else, get this. And so, can I get a wow? (laughs) Awesome, guys. We share the same status As Jesus. The Jesus that we pray to, we have the same status as him because of what he has done. Jesus' father, the father that he loves, the father that he trusts is now our father, your father, my father. Who delights in you? He delights in you just as he delights in Jesus. Many of you probably come here feeling guilty or whatever because of what you've done in the past. But Jesus and his father delights in you. 
I kneel before that father, says Paul. Says Paul in jail. That father, that father who is able, massively able. Paul expresses this ability of the father in his doxology. He says, now to him who is able, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Massively able. And we must remember about this exclamation of praise that Paul expresses this, Paul expresses this outburst of praise, this doxology from a prison cell. Every time you read this passage, remember that it comes from a prison cell, not coming from a church conference, for example, which is easier for us, it's conducive for us to exclaim praise, not coming from a revival, not coming from a theological library, not coming from a monastery. It's coming from a dark, stinky prison cell. Imagine that. Now to him who is able. Able to do what we ask. Able to do what we imagine. Able to do what we ask or imagine. But also able to do far more than we ask or imagine. Able to do abundantly far more than we ask or imagine. Immeasurably beyond what we ask or imagine. Wow. Yes, that deserves a wow. Adults, you're not too convinced. I see the kids are still more convinced. See, I told you, they get it. They get it. So what are you facing today? What are you facing today? The God before whom Paul kneels is able. Praise God. He is able. And he acts out of his glorious riches. Wow. Glory is just a simple way of saying all that makes God be God. Glorious riches is the riches of God's very essence. And what is that? That's wisdom. That's power, that's majesty, that's love, that's justice. It's creativity. We are creative because we are created in the, as image of God who is the most creative one. Unfa wow, there you go. Yes, kids are very creative. We, you know, we're like, yeah, right? Unfathomable riches. The Father of the Lord Jesus Christ acts toward us out of the inexhaustible wealth of God's very being. Yes, wow. Woo! I'm amazed. I get goosebumps every time I hear this prayer. So let's now look at the prayer. We look at the Father. Let's look at the prayer. The prayer consists of two parts. There are two parts of a prayer. The first part of this prayer, Paul takes our hearts and bring it to the Father. Paul says, that out of glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, Paul says. Yes, wow. It is. Wow. Paul takes our heart into his hands. Lift them up to God and pray, Father, you who are able to do beyond anything we can imagine, anything we can dream of, will you out of the bottomless well of your very being, will you strengthen our inner being? Will you invigorate our inner being so that by the power of your spirit, by the power that raised Jesus from the dead, Jesus can dwell in every nook and cranny of our existence. Wow. <laughs> we should have family service every weekend, right? No, probably you'll get bored. I'm sorry. It'll be torturous to you guys, more better for us. In this prayer, Paul is not asking that Christ come to dwell in our hearts. Christ has already done that. He has come to believers and began to make his dwelling with us. When we come to faith, Christ has begun to take his dwelling in us. That's what makes us Christians. When we believe, the dwelling has already begun. 
what Paul is praying is that by the power of the Spirit, by the power that raised Jesus from the dead, this indwelling might be all that Christ wants it to be. Paul is praying that Christ might completely dwell in our hearts. And you see why, of course. It takes power. It takes power to alter everything in our hearts around a new person who just moved in. It takes power to change our routines. It takes power to change our habits, our attitudes. I know this very well. Power to switch everything at the beck and call of the new master that has now moved into our hearts. It takes power to remodel our hearts. It takes power to remodel the house, the house that the master has made its, his own. God is remodeling our hearts. Let me read you a quote from C.S. Lewis. Just as last week, this quote is also from Mere Christianity. A, a quote to make sense of this house remodeling idea. In Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis said, Imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps you can understand what he's doing. He's getting the drains right, stopping the leaks in the roof, and so on. You know that those jobs needed doing, so you're not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house, knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably and does not make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he's building quite a different house from the one you thought of, throwing out a new wing here putting on extra floor there, running out towers, making courtyards. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage, but he's building a palace, and he intends to come and live in that palace himself. Yes. Wow. It's, it's, (laughs) make some noise, kids. (laughs) Yes, because it's an incredible vision. It deserves our great wow. But it takes power. Power so that we will let him do such a thing. Power to let go of of our control, which is not ours to begin with, but we cling to it so dearly, over to the new master. Here, Jesus, take control. Father, will you exercise your power, Paul says. The power that raised Christ from the dead so we can let go of our hearts and let Christ be the master of our hearts as he make his dwelling in our hearts. And then the second part of the prayer. And he says, I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power, again, that word power, together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, experience, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God, filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. That's a mouthful. Now, people throughout church history have rightly said that this second half of Paul's prayer is the boldest prayer anyone could ever pray. Second only to the prayer of Jesus himself that we find in the Gospel of John chapter 17. This second half of the prayer actually began with an exclamation. With an exclamation. As typical of Paul, right in the middle of this wonderfully crafted sentence, Paul breaks into an exclamation. Breaks out into an exclamation. He says, you are rooted and established In love. You are rooted and established in love. He's not praying that we become rooted and we become established in love. That is already the case, even if we do not yet experience it. Because of all of what God has done for the world in Jesus, and because Jesus Christ has come to dwell in our hearts, Paul can exclaim, You are rooted and established in love. You are rooted and established in love. You are rooted and established in love. Wow! (laughs) Right on. And and Paul, I think he has skills in being a linguist because he loves mixing metaphors. Rooted is an agriculture metaphor, a farming metaphor. 
And establish is an architectural metaphor. The literal translation of this verb is to be grounded, to take foundation. And he does this earlier in chapter 2 when he speaks of us being a building that is growing into a holy temple. He does that also to the disciples in Corinth, where he says that they are God's building. They are God's field, as twisted as the church in Corinth is. Paul still says that they are God's building and God's field. In Colossians, he said that we are rooted and established in faith, rooted and grounded in Christ. You are rooted and established in love. Tell that to your neighbor. You are rooted and established in love. I, I like that part. But <laughs> you are rooted and established in love. Adults, you don't sound too convinced. Say that to your neighbor. You are rooted and established in love. Now, to convince yourself, say, I am rooted and established in love. Yes, we're all rooted and established in love. And then Paul gets to praying again. That you may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long and how high and deep is the love of Christ. The love that we are rooted and established in. And why is this important? Because love is the soil in which we are growing. Love is the foundation of which we are standing. We are rooted and established in love and that we should have, Paul prays, that we may have Power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is this love. May have the power, Paul prays. Because Paul realizes the challenge that we are facing. And he has, he's asking God, the Father, to make us strong enough to have the power to press on through the challenge. And what is this challenge? This challenge is to grasp to comprehend, to take hold, to seize. He's asking the Father to make us strong enough to have the power to grasp, catch, seize, and take hold of. It is the same verb that Paul uses in his letter to the Philippians, where he said, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Paul takes our heart into his hand and prays to the Father so that we may have the power to catch to grasp, to seize, to lay hold of the width, length, height, and depth. Four-dimensional. Now, what do these terms, width, length, and height, and depth, referring to? What did Paul have in mind when he's talking about these four dimensions? Well, it is none other than the love of God in Christ Jesus. In prison, Paul asked the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ to make us, by the Holy Spirit, have the power to be strong enough, to be strong enough to catch, to grasp, to seize, to lay hold of the width and length and the height and depth of the love of God in Jesus Christ. Wow. wow. <laughs> Notice that he prays, may have the power may have the power. Why? Why does he pray may have the power? Why pray this way? Because Paul knows us. Paul knows our hearts. He knows that we all have external circumstances or even internal dynamics that keep us from grasping, keep us from laying hold of, keep us from seizing the love of God in Jesus Christ. Some of us experience things in childhood that keep haunting us. And then, therefore, preventing us from experiencing the love of God. Some of us have these recordings that kept playing over and over and over again in our minds. Telling us that we are unworthy. Telling us that we are unworthy of anyone's love, let alone the love of God. It keeps on playing. You are unworthy. Some of us have done things in our past that we can simply forget. We simply cannot forget the things that we've done, and it keeps us from experiencing the love of God. Some of us are facing circumstances that seem to call the love of God into question. I question your love, God. I don't trust you. Many of us look into the misery of the world, and we ask 
Where's God? God's not here. Some of us are disappointed with God. Some of us feel that God has let us down. And we're not sure that we can trust this claim that he loves us. And some of us, especially those who grew up in church, have been trying to be a good Christian all of our life. Some of us have been trying to keep the rule, so to speak. And then we see God not acting in ways we think we deserve God to act. And we're angry with God because of that. God, what are you doing this? I've been good to you. I'm angry at you. And that anger keeps us from experiencing anyone's love, let alone the love of God. And then, of course, there's the enemy of Jesus. The enemy of our souls, which we talked about last weekend. This enemy of our souls does not want any human being to know God and to know his love. He keeps adding fuel, adding fuel into our sense of unworthiness. He keeps pointing to our sins. He keeps telling us that our sins make us unworthy of the love of God. Father, Paul prays, make them have the power to overcome all obstacles. May ha- make them have the power to overcome any and all of the lies and confusions that may have. Make them so that they have power to be strong enough to lay hold of the width and height and length and depth of your love for the world in Jesus Christ. Father, help them seize the width of your love. Your love is wide enough, wide enough to include millions and millions of every nation and clan. Father, help them seize the length of your love, the love that is long enough that it keeps going to eternity, long enough that it reaches out to the farthest place. No one is beyond the reach of this love. Father, help them seize the height of your love, the height that goes all the way to heaven, the height that lifts them up in Christ, seats them up in the heavenly places. Father, help them to seize the depth of your love, the the love that goes down, all the way down, down, down in Jesus, all the way down into the depths of our sinfulness, of our sickness, of our brokenness, all the way down into our darkness. You came all the way down and lay hold of them. Father, empower them to lay hold of your love. Wow. And if that were not enough, Paul then prays, The prayer that just blows the electrical switchboard. I pray that out of his glorious riches, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. I pray that out of his glorious riches, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Be filled. Notice that it's passive, which means that we do not do this filling. We try to, but we fail. It's passive, the so-called divine passive, because only God can do the filling. Only God can fill us. So, Father, fill them. The verb is more translated better as completely fill. Completely fill them, Father. Fill them up to full capacity. Fill them up to the brim. And then the measure of this filling is even more mind-blowing. It's not liter, right? Full tank must, right? And then you pay 40 liters for whatever, right? It's not liters. The measure of this filling is the fullness of God. <laughs> wow. See, they get it. The fullness of God. Paul takes our hearts into his hands. Lift them up before God, the God of the Father, the, the, the God of the gospel, who is our Father, and ask that they be so completely filled that the filling can only be measured by the fullness of God. Can you handle this? <laughs> wow. <laughs> you guys are awesome kids. Now, what is this fullness of God bit? What is this whole fullness of God? It's, it's hard to explain. But I think one scholar gets as, about as close as he possibly can when he writes this sentence. And I quote, 
The fullness of God is the sum total of the divine attributes. The fullness of God is the sum total of God's wisdom and power and holiness and on and on the list goes. The fullness of God is the sum total of the divine attributes like the glory of God is all that makes God be God. The fullness of God, oh my goodness, down on his knees in prison out of all places. Paul prays that we broken, imperfect, empty human beings be filled up to the degree, be filled up to the extent to the level that can only be measured by the sum total of all the divine attributes. Can you handle this? Whew. That's the time when we get to be slain in the spirit if we are all charismatic and Pentecostal. Right? Now, the question is, what does God fill us with? What does God fill us with so that the filling is, can only be measured by the fullness of God? With what does God fill us. Are you ready for the answer? Now, kids, I'm going to need your help again because sometimes this filling is hard to be received by adults, by people like me. So I need your wow when I tell everyone, what does God fill us with? Are you ready? God fills us with the fullness of God. Yes! Yes! God fills us with the fullness of God so that the filling can only be measured by the fullness of God. I know it's a mouthful, but it is wow. It deserves a wow. In his letter to the Colossians, which is a sister letter to the Ephesians, Paul says that the fullness of God dwells in Christ. And it's easy for us to accept that, right, as followers of Christ. But then in chapter 2, Paul says that in Christ, we have been brought to fullness. In relationship to Jesus Christ, we participate with all that is in Jesus Christ. In Christ Jesus, we are in his fullness, and his fullness is the fullness of God. Wow! It's mind-blowing. It gives me the chills. You see why the church has called this the boldest prayer ever prayed, right? Paul is asking the Father of Jesus to fill the disciples of Jesus, that's you and me, with and to the measure of all that makes the living God be the living God. Oh, can you handle this? I can't. It's overwhelming. We can't handle it. It's overwhelming. It has to overwhelm us. Because Paul is not praying for a little spiritual pick-me-up. Paul is not praying that somehow our perspective gets changed and that we are able to cope with the stresses of our lives, although that is a good thing to pray. Paul is not praying for a, 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 an injection in the arm, a little shot in the arm that help us go on living our self-empowered lives, which is an oxymoron because we don't live self-empowered lives. We live spirit-empowered lives. Amen? Paul is not praying like, you know, people... Sometimes, you know, televangelists would do this, just receive Jesus in your life so that you can go to heaven kind of prayer. No, not like that. He's praying that the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ fill us up with himself. Wow. God, you're awesome. That the living God fill us so full that the filling can only be measured by the fullness of God himself. Can you handle that? No, of course not. But God can. God can handle it. It's actually his good pleasure, his good pleasure to answer this prayer. Wow! wow. <laughs> wow. It's his good pleasure to answer this prayer. Now, because this prayer is so bold, it is important to point out that Paul does not then go on to suggest that as a result of this filling, we become little gods. We don't become little gods. Instead, the filling makes us godly. The filling with the fullness of God makes us godly. Thank God I can be godly. You see, when you fill a glass with water, the glass stays a glass, right? It doesn't become water. When you feel, fill a balloon with helium... The balloon doesn't become helium. It stays a balloon. Have you 
played with a balloon filled with helium before. Kids, I know you've done that before, right? And sometimes you will open it up and then yeah. But, you know, the balloon remains a balloon. When you fill a human being with the filling of God, we don't become God. Quite the contrary, to be filled up with God finally makes us truly human. Wow. Yes. <laughs> you know, so no more excuses. I don't want to hear anybody from IES to say, I'm only human. No. When we're acting, missing the point, we're actually acting less than human. To be filled up with God finally makes us truly human. We finally become the image of God we were meant to be. It is only when God breathed his breath into this dusty earthly creature that Adam, who was just like a Pinocchio before, became a human being. And so too with all of Adam's descendants. When the triune God fills us with all that makes the triune God be God, we are finally all that we are meant to be. Imago Dei. The image of God. The icon of God. You see what great compliment that is being paid to all of us in this prayer. The Bible has a very high vision of anthropology. The value of humanity is so high. And in this prayer, we're, giving, we're given that great compliment. We are precious in God's eyes. Paul's prayer says that we were made in such a way that the only thing that finally fills us is God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Nothing else can finally satisfy our hearts and souls. Because we were made by God and for God, the only thing that finally fills us is God. One more time, kids. Yes. Nothing else can satisfy us. The only thing that finally fills us is God. Oh, I really admire Paul for his missionary zeal. I love to hear Paul preach and teach his theology. But I love the fact that he is a charismatic. I love to hear him pray, to pray the gospel of our Father, the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. The prayer is nothing in moderation. It is blatant. It is extravagant. Father, make us strong enough. Make us have the power to lay hold of your boundless love and fill us up to all of your fullness. Paul prays for us. And because he is our good father, it is his good pleasure to grant this prayer. Now, isn't that something to celebrate about our good father in this Our Father's Day? Now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen.